Cool. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. Cool. Um, so my name is Kavya, and I don't really have time to talk about myself because I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to open up the, the Go Race Detector to show you the machinery on the inside and how it works. Um, now to kick things off, uh, let's do something that's uh, especially fun, right? Uh, reason about concurrency. Uh, so here's a simple program. This is the example program we'll be using in the rest of the talk. Um, all the program does is it spawns two threads. This is a Go program, so these are Go routines or user space threads. But these might as well be system threads in a program like Java, right? So we spawn two threads. They both execute increment count, which reads a shared count variable. And if its value is um, zero, it, it increments it. How many takers for a final value of count being one? No believers. Well, it can actually be one, right? If G1 fully executes before G2, we would get a final value of one. However, if G1's write and G2's read happen at the same time, whatever that means, if they happen at the same time, then the final value of count is two. Now, um, the, the point of this, this program is to establish and help, uh, help remind you that the final value of count here uh, depends on the ordering of events, which is determined at runtime. And this comes down to the fact that we have two threads accessing a shared memory location. And this is what um, th is called a data race. Um, when you have two or more threads, which can be user space or um, system threads, and they concurrently access a shared memory location, and one of those accesses is a write, that's what we call a data race. Now, this example um, illustrates um, one particularly intriguing property of data races, is that, and that's that they're elusive, right? Is my program going to have a, a final value of one? Is it going to have a final value of two? Uh, I don't know. We'll have to run it. Um, another interesting property of them, uh, of data races, is that they have wild, undefined consequences. And this goes back to um, the compiler optimizations that your compiler performs. Right? And that, in turn, goes back to the memory model of your programming language, um, which gives you, the programmer, certain guarantees um, about memory access events and the order they're going to occur in. So the compiler is going to assume that you've written a race-free program because it can make that assumption. And if you break that assumption, then all bets are off. So the point of this is that data races are not just interesting. They're also kind of really important to fix. So the question then is, well, if they're elusive, how do you find them to begin with? Uh, and once you've found them, how do you fix them? The second question, um, as we all know here, um, is relatively, dare I say, straightforward, right? Uh, you restructure your code, uh, you use lock-free synchronization, you add a lock, whatever. But the first question remains, um, how do you find them to begin with? Well, in my case, I bust out my favorite race detector tool, the Go Race Detector. And running that against the racy count program gives me a race report that looks like this. This is packed with all sorts of useful information. And armed with this information, I can go and uh, fix my code. Um, now, this is probably true of a number of you. But every time I come across one of these seemingly magical, wondrous tools, the burning question to me is how? How do they work? So let's talk about that. Starting from the top, uh, this is the definition of a data race, right? It requires two or more threads to concurrently, at the same time, access a memory location. So the question then is, to detect data races, we need to detect um, concurrent memory accesses. So how do we do that? How do we determine concurrent memory accesses? Well, concurrent sort of means at the same time, but what's time even? What does at the same time even mean? So how do we answer this question? Well, um, we can stare really hard at the code, like we just did. Or we can be smarter. We can re-ask the question to be a question that we know the answer to. So instead, let's say uh, we have two memory access events, um, G1's write and G2's read. I'm going to call them x and y. Uh, and our question is, how do we know if they happened at the same time? Um, or not? Let's re-ask the question to say, well, if we, can conclude, uh, if we can conclude that we can order them, we can say that x happened before y, 
or y happened before x, then we're all set, right? We can conclude that they didn't happen at the same time. However, conversely, if we can't establish that ordering uh, between them, uh, they could have happened at the same time. So re-asking the question, this becomes, can x and y be ordered by happens before? Now, happens before sounds awfully familiar to me. How many people here have heard of happens before? A number of people. Happens before, the last time you've seen it, is probably in the context of distributed systems, right? Leslie Lamport came up with this idea of happens before, causal, uh, causal ordering. Um, and in distributed systems land, uh, the answer is, well, use vector clocks. How many people here have heard of vector clocks? A lot more, nice. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the answer from distributed systems land and apply it to the problem of race detection. Um, a quick primer on vector clocks, because I, my distributed systems class certainly was a long time ago. Um, so for this example, we'll be using a slightly modified version um, of the RACI count program. It's called, or I like to call it, count with a lock, and it's self-explanatory. It has a lock. Um, so vector clocks, right? The idea behind a vector clock, a vector clock is simply an array of logical clocks, scalar clocks, so think um, versions, not timestamps. Um, and um, each, each element in the vector clock corresponds to a goroutine's or a thread's logical clock. And each thread in your system holds on to its own vector clock and updates it according to certain rules. Um, one rule is each time a goroutine performs an event, it's going to uh, update its element in its vector clock, right? So G1 just performed an event, it performed another event, uh, it performed a third event, and performed a fourth event. Now, G2 is going to come along, and it's going to perform its first event, so notice the rightmost element's zero, 01. Um, and the second rule about vector clocks is that um, when a goroutine observes the events of another goroutine, it's going to increment that goroutine's element in its vector clock, right? So now in this case, the unlock and lock set of events is special. Because when G1 unlocks the mutex and then G2 comes along and acquires it, G2 is effectively, has effectively observed or is aware of all the events uh, that G1 performed while it was holding the lock. Um, so for example, when G2 performs a read of count, it's going to see the value that G1 wrote. Um, so, this, so this is not concurrent, right? So it's going to see the latest value written to by G1. Um, so vector clocks are supposed to help us establish these happens before relations and determine concurrency. Um, let's make sure that actually holds. So uh, this is our example, and the question is, did G1's write happen before G2's read? Did the event at X happen before the event at Y? Um, and in vector clock land, this translates to a simple, is the vector clock at X strictly less than the vector, the vector clock at Y? Um, in this case, it is, so we can order them. They, those two events are not concurrent. This is vector clocks applied to our Ricci count example. Um, in this case, we have the same question. Does X happen before Y? No. Does Y happen before X? Nope. So we can conclude that they are concurrent. All right, so that's all the grad school literature I'm gonna throw at you today. Um, but this effectively is exactly what the Go race detector does. It implements a form of dynamic race detection called pure happens before detection. Um, where it uses vector clocks to determine concurrent memory accesses. Um, let's go take a look at the implementation. So the question now is, to implement happens before detection, what would the Go race detector need to do? Well, let's see. Um, at Go routine creation, it would have to create these vector clocks. Um, then at each memory access and each synchronization event, it would have to update these vector clocks based on those rules that we just saw. And finally, at every memory access, it also has to compare vector clocks to detect a data race. Now, if you stare really hard at these bullet points, um, you will see that once again, 
we can tease apart the problem into two subproblems that we already know how to solve. The first problem is, or the first question is, can we get the program to, to, to call out into the race detector every time it performs an event of interest? So every time it creates a Go routine or performs a memory access of synchronization, can we have the program call out into the Go race detector? And then the second question is, can we, can we then um, have the race detector machinery effectively act like a state machine and maintain the vector clocks and update them, effectively react to the events coming in um, from the program? Why do we know the answer to these questions? Well, the first question, the problem of event generation, um, we're programmers. How do we get our programs to do the things we want? Well, option one is you put it in the source code which is exactly what the Go standard library does. So if you go look at the source, um, you will see the, it's littered, or not littered, but it has a number of calls um, if race.enabled blocks, which are essentially calls out to the race detector. Um, and in the case of memory accesses, we obviously need another scheme. Um, so what else can we do? Well, we'll have the compiler do it for us. So the Go GC compiler, Go has two compilers, but this is relevant only to the GC compiler. The GC compiler uh, instruments memory accesses uh, as it compiles your program, uh, and it, it inserts those calls out to the race detector for you. So this is neat. It means that as a, as a programmer, you can write whatever program you want um, and, um, have it, and have the race detector run against it. What about the second question? That seems kind of tricky. Uh, how do you, what about the race detector machinery? And the answer the, to this turns out to be, well, use an existing race detector. Uh, the Go race detector is built on top of an older C++ race detector called Thread Sanitizer that um, some of you at Google might be familiar with. Uh, TSAN itself is about as old as the Go programming language itself, right? The Go race detector only came out in like 2013, but TSAN's been around for, from 2008, 2009 onwards. And the Go race detector essentially is just calls into thread sanitizer. And it's thread sanitizer that implements happens before detection um, and does whatever needs to be done with vector clocks. So finally, let's talk about thread sanitizer and see how it uh, implements uh, race detection. So again, using our race count program, when you spawn a Go routine, so this is G1 being spawned, um, TSAN creates a vector clock and returns it to be stored on the Go routine. G1 performs its first memory access. Um, at this point, TSAN needs to do two things. It needs to first check if there's a data race with a previous access. And if there isn't, it needs to store information about this access for future detections. Um, let's talk about two first. So uh, Thread Sanitizer stores information about uh, memory accesses in a directly mapped region of memory called the shadow state or shadow memory. And for a memory access, it creates a shadow word, which uh, on a 64-bit is an 8-byte word, uh, which contains information about that memory access, right? Specifically, it contains the accessing Go routine's ID. Um, it contains the Go routine's clock. The, it contains the position, the memory access, the location, um, and whether the access was a write or not. Now, it's worth mentioning this one optimization. Obviously, there are a number of optimizations. Um, but the one optimization that's worth mentioning um, is that it doesn't store the entire vector clock of the accessing Go routine. It only stores the logical clock, the scalar clock. And if you think that this causes a precision hit, um, it surprisingly and sort of amazingly does not. And we'll see that in a second. All right, so back to our program. Um, at the end of G1's memory access, um, its vector clock is updated and it has a shadow word. Now, it performs a second memory access. It performs a write. So its vector clock is updated, and um, a new shadow word is created. Now G2 comes along, and G2 performs a read. So it has its own vector clock, a third shadow word is created, and finally, it's time to check for a race. When it comes down to the actual race detection, the, what TSAN has to do 
turns out to be beautifully simple. Um, all it has to do is check if the accessing Go routine's full vector clock and, um, the, and the new shadow word, it has to compare that with each existing shadow word that it's stored away in the shadow memory. So what exactly is it checking for? Well, this, right? It's checking for a data race, that definition. So let's break that definition down. The first thing is, do the access locations overlap? For this, we're going to use the shadow words. Well, yes, the access locations do overlap. It's the same location. Are any of the accesses a right? Why, yes, one of them is a right. Are the accessing go routines different? Um, using the, the stored go routine IDs? Yes, they are. And finally, are the accesses concurrent? Can we order them by happens before or not? Um, for this, let's, let's use the vector clocks and all that vector clock talk, right? So the question comes down to, this is the existing shadow words vector clock, um, or scalar clock, and this is G2's vector clock. And we want to know if we can um, establish a, a strictly less than one way or another. Um, what do you think? Well, let's see. Two is greater than zero, and irrespective of what the value of question mark is, it must be less than one, right? Because question mark corresponds to G2's um, element, and G2 is just performing its first update, or its first event. Um, so they can't be straight, so they can't be ordered. Um, and so we have a race. Um, now this is, this is cool. But I've only barely scratched the surface of uh, thread sanitizer or how race detection works, right? One of the things that TSAN must do is track access to the synchronization primitives to locks um, because those are what establish um, the happens before ordering between go routines. Um, and to do that, uh, TSAN uses um, something called the sync var. Uh, which stores a which stores a which stores a vector clock itself. Um, so I might have a slide for this. And this is how um, the sync var works. Works right. So when G one gives up, releases its mutex, um, its vector clock is stored in the is stored in the sync var. So the next acquirer of that clock. Um, essentially can copy over that the, the previous vector clock and apply the max update rule. Um, and that's how that happens before, and that's how TSAN um, detects synchronization events. All right, cool. So there are a number of other cool things that Thread Sanitizer and the Go Race Detector do. Uh, there are a number of clever optimizations to, decre to decrease the memory overhead. Um, the support for your custom sync primitives via dynamic annotations. It's a huge and very interesting C++ code base that I um, encourage you to go check out. Um, to wrap things up, however, um, I would like to leave with um, saying that you, I, I hope you all enjoy the talk. Uh, and I hope you leave with an appreciation for a problem of, for an appreciation for the problem of race detection, um, and also a recognition of, in the case of the race detector, once again, we've seen how new technology can essentially, if you tease it apart just right, um, essentially decomposes cleverly into old technology um, in the form of vector clocks and in the form of uh, thread sanitizer. Thank you.